truth is, did you know Larry Presswood? I did know Larry. And he was one of those impressive people you don't forget. He was a thinker. He was committed to trying to make Cleveland the best it could be. And I always admired that about him. He'd, you know, he'd come to the Cleveland Daily Banner from time to time with some plans he thought would work with Cleveland and trying to sell the ideas that he had. But, yeah. uh, and I guess in that vein, you could call him a salesman too. Because <laughs> he had a good pitch about anything he believed in, he was passionate about. He was passionate. I'd say that's what you could say about Larry, he was passionate. Yeah. Are you about his age or, or is he, was he a lot older? Than no, you? I'm 83 and I don't think he was that old. I, did, I didn't see in the, I did read the I obituary. I think he was 78. That sounds about right. Yeah. So that, that puts you in being raised in the 1950s. Yeah, the 50s were my time. That was my high school time. Yeah. They say that was the greatest time yes. to be, to be, uh, to be a, a teenager. It was. Like happy, the movie Happy, was it like Happy Days? Maybe the, even better than Happy Days. Um, I mean, was, was Happy Days, the sitcom, pretty close to the 50s? It was. And this is the thing about it. And, and my class of 1956 from Kugel Central High School has been a class that's been incredibly close to each other. Closer, and I've talked to other friends I've had graduating other classes, closer than most other classes. We just had a bond with each other. And I don't know exactly why uh, we liked the music, we liked the time, we liked being what was, together. What was the music? Well, of course, Elvis and uh, all those early rockers before him. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I go to Five Point Cafe a lot and they play that kind of music, which I like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, having said that, we decided when we graduated as a class, we would get together every five years. And we've been faithful about doing that, although over the last five years, I guess, so many of us have started dying out that the class has decided they're going to try to do something every year, mostly just uh, dinner together at Cookville somewhere. But do, do you get together with the class that graduated the year before and the year after or just that just year? Just 56. I always thought it'd be neat to get the class before and the class after because you're just so intermixed with them. I, right. some, some of my friends, I can't even remember if they graduated before me or after me. Yeah. But, well, and I had friends in both ways, before and after, but 56 was remarkable. So the 50s were before the drugs and after the war. Right. Times were good. Happy days. Happy days. Did you, uh, it, now Cookville, Tennessee, that's, um, that's uh, middle, middle Tennessee, right? That's where John Hale's from, isn't it? It is, yeah. I don't see him anymore. Home of Tennessee Tech. You ever see John Hale anymore? I haven't seen him in a while, no. I hadn't seen him in... Yeah, he's a great guy, though. I like John. Everybody yeah. likes John. Yeah. And that Hale name is prominent in Cookville, too, that mm -hmm. family name. I wonder whatever happened to him. I think he moved to Polk County. I don't know. I'll see him tomorrow. Isn't that the way that happens? <laughs> you, you think of somebody you hadn't seen in a while, next thing you know, you see him the next day? Yeah. I think God has a sense of humor, to be honest. He has to. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you like, uh, how, were you born in Cookville? Born and raised. Um, my father was a tenant farmer, uh, had a farm about four miles outside of Cookville. And so the first six years of my life, I lived there. And then we moved into town. So when I say I'm a country boy, my wife laughs at that because she lived on the farm till we married. Says you don't know anything at all about work on the farms. So don't say you're a country boy. <laughs> Your wife is one of the nicest people I know. Well, I'd have to say it is. <laughs> <laughs> she is remarkable. She Was is she from nice. Cookville also? She lived about 12 miles outside of Cookville on the farm that actually was at the intersection of Jackson and Overton in Putnam County. It's that area right there. Her father was a, a farmer and well, he did a lot of things. He was a farmer for a lot of his life, but he was also a rural mail carrier by horseback. Mm -hmm. 
and by he, horseback. Yeah, and he also taught school for a while. How would they do that by horseback? They have a wagon? No, they just have a saddlebags and a horse. Hmm. Well, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So, uh, did y'all meet in high school? Well, not exactly. I, I, uh, I went all four years to Cookville Central, and I was one grade ahead of her. So, <laughs> I guess when you go to high school and you're a freshman, you're pretty green at things. But when you promote up to the to the sophomore year, you kind of think you've arrived a little bit. You know? Yeah. And she was in a freshman year when I was a sophomore. I didn't have any classes with her, but I'd see her walking through the halls. And I thought then, this is a beautiful girl. <laughs> uh, but I never did meet her there. Um, in fact, I said to one of my friends one time as a sophomore, I saw her go by the hall, I said, you know, that's a beautiful girl, but look how young these freshmen get every year. <laughs> but she, she left after a freshman year and went to Allgood High School, which, you know where Allgood is? Mm -mm. It's about three or four miles uh, north of Cookville. And since then, they've consolidated the high schools, but she went to high school there. And after we'd both graduated from high school, she was working at a downtown five and 10 cent store. And her best friend and my best friend started dating each other. And so Lois, her best friend, started telling Lola about me and that we ought to double date together. Mm -hmm. So my best Frank. What did she tell Frank, her about you? Huh? What did she tell her about you? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> She just, I think she just said somebody she thought that I'd like to date. Yeah. So they arranged a, a double date and bingo, it was all from there. We dated three years though before we married. Just three years? Yeah. So that'd be, that'd be a short time now. <laughs> that was probably a long time then, right? Uh, no, maybe not, maybe not, so. Were, were the 50s, what, what was different about the 50s? in your opinion, or at least your memory of them. Okay. My memory of it, of course, Cookville then, uh, the, you know, World War II having been over just a few years before that, but there was a sense of patriotism, of looking out for one another, neighbors for neighbors. Um, there was a, there was a, strong, uh, because of Tennessee Tech, I think, there was a strong emphasis on getting college education. And Tennessee Tech was kind of the um, place, I guess, responsible for Cougville growing like it did. Everything kind of revolved in and around Tech. And um, I had never, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. But being close to tech and understanding the importance of an education, I wanted to go. And although I lived about four blocks from Tennessee Tech, the high school was on beyond that. So I would walk to school and I go through the campus every day on the way to high school and think, I want to go here someday. I want to be a tech student. I want to get my education here. See, and this is a long story, so maybe I don't so get time. into it. Um, we were a poor family. We didn't have a lot of money. As I said, my father was a tenant farmer. When he moved into town, he, he worked for just a few years in a lumber mill. And then he'd always had a hobby of cutting hair for family members and so on. So he finally decided that he'd open up his own barbershop, which he did, and did that for most of his life. And so my mother, when I was a junior, I was, I'm the oldest of three boys, but when I was a junior in high school, my mother announced to the family she was going to get a job outside the home because she wanted all three of her sons to get a college education, but she was denied. Um, when she uh, was in the eighth grade, her father died of, a, of appendicitis, that, and a month later, her mother died. 
So this left my mother with the responsibility of taking care of younger, younger siblings. She had three sisters and a brother. And she had to drop out of school to do whatever she could to help raise those kids with the help of some other family members, but she was mostly responsible for that. So she didn't get an education that she wanted to get. So she was determined that her three sons get a college education. She took a job as a dishwasher in a restaurant in downtown Cookville and worked there for two years and then the Wilson, Wilson Sporting Goods Company had a big plant in Cookville and she was able to get a job there and her shift was like four o'clock till midnight every day. So my father would go to get her and then when I was able to get a car, he or I wanted to pick her up at midnight and I could see how tired that she was you know, working at home, going to work, working till midnight. And, uh, but she did it because she wanted to help her sons go to college. So when I graduated from tech, that was a happy day for her. My father and mother standing at the end of the graduation line, that was one of the happiest times in her life. And she, uh, she was my biggest cheerleader. And when I graduated, I wanted a college ring, but I couldn't afford it, this ring here. That ring then cost $85. Do you know what that ring is worth now? That, that $85 would be valued in today's currency with inflation and everything, $750. There was no way <laughs> coming out of college, I'd been able to work two part-time jobs. And, and they Lola, didn't have credit then like they do now, I, right, I assume. Right. And, and Lola, uh, when we got married as a junior, she was working to help get me through school too, but, but I couldn't afford a, a ring at $85. Two years after I graduated, one Christmas morning, there was a little box with my name on it. And I opened it up. It was this ring. My mother had bought it for me because she knew how disappointed I was that I didn't get this ring. Now, the other part of the story is when my father was in the hospital with a stroke that killed him eventually. I was there one day visiting with him, and uh, I told my mother, I'm going to go downstairs and have some lunch. Can I bring you anything? She said, no, I'll, I'll get something later. So I went down to a booth in the cafeteria, and in a few minutes, Glenn Ramsey, who was president of Citizens Bank in Cookville, and been a friend for a long time. He walked up and said, uh, mind if I join you for lunch? I said, no, Glenn, I'd be happy to, for you too. And we talked a few minutes, he said, I'm going to break a promise that I made to your mother, but you need to know this. While you were in college, she came to me three different times asking for a loan for you to get you through college. She never told me that. Once in a while, I'd get some money, and I thought maybe somehow she'd saved it from where she was working. But uh, Glenn said, I think you ought to know what your mother did for you. So I wear two rings on my hands for the two most important women in my life, Lola, my wedding ring, and this ring. I'm proud of my graduation from Tennessee Tech, but I'm even prouder of that ring because it represents my mother's love for me and her desire for me to get an education. That's a special ring for me. You wouldn't take 10,000 for that No ring. way, <laughs> no way. So I had a, I was blessed with uh, parents who loved me and. That's very fitting on Mother's Day. It is, that's one reason I want to tell you that story. Do you think of that on Mother's Day? Yeah, and more than that. <laughs> and other stories, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. There's not anything a mother won't do for their kids. You got that right. And when I say anything, I mean, that's just born. That's just in them. It, it is. You know, a father's love is special too. And I and I love my father. He was, he was the kind of father any boy would want. But there's just something about a mother's love. I think. I wonder what the difference is. I don't. Is it know. Because the baby was a part of them. In their maybe maybe so, maybe so. You know, even animals in the wild, they're like that. There's very yeah. few animals that don't take care of their... Right. 
And it's generally the mother. <laughs> it's generally the mother. That's right. That's just nature's way. Yeah. Or God's way. Yeah. I saw on television yesterday that uh, some of the folks are, are beginning to call mothers birthing persons. <laughs> birthing persons. Listen, there is, there is, there's nothing more special. Who's for it? Who would, what kind of person would be for that? I do not know. I mean, know. can we not I mean, waste our time on something else? Exactly. I mean, it just makes no sense. No. Now, in the 50s, people were, mothers have not changed since the 50s to now, and probably even 200 years ago. How long has Mother's Day been around? That, who started that, Rick? Um, I don't, that's a good question. I don't know. I think... Um, Department stores? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know how, what the history of it is, but I think maybe Ronald Reagan, um, maybe even before him. We could Google it and see, but yeah, even might be wrong. But might, we, before, <laughs> might be before Reagan that they designated a certain day. I mean, I think it was, I think it was observed, you know, much further back, but I think maybe... Maybe he had something to do with designating the day. When you were in high school and you were thinking about going to college, did you know you were going to be a, an administrator and a CEO? And You know, that, that's another long story. Because <laughs> um, you're, you're, I've heard the name Beecher Hunter my entire life. Well, again, growing up in Cookville around Tennessee Tech, um, I'd watch those civil engineering students out doing their field work with their ransoms and levels and that sort of thing. And in grammar school, I watched all that and I thought, you know, that'd be a great career. You could work outside some and draw mm -hmm. br br bridges and roads, mm -hmm. uh, material to make that happen and, and make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So I decided in the eighth grade, you know, a lot of the kids weren't sure what they wanted to do for a career. I decided in the eighth grade, I was gonna be a civil engineer. So all through high school, I took all the math courses to get ready for that. Trigonometry, algebra, solid geometry, to get ready for civil engineering. And graduated with high school with that in mind. So 1956 in the fall, I enrolled at Tennessee Tech in civil engineering. After the third quarter, I decided this is not for me. It's too complicated. I didn't, I, I don't know, I didn't like the courses for some reason. Do you think we force kids to decide what they want to do by the time they get out of college? I think I mean, isn't that's that true. Such a, I think that's true. A handicap? Yeah. And I think part of this, I admit that part of this, I was not making good grades. I think part of this was that I had two part-time jobs and I was seriously pursuing Lola <laughs> and I wasn't studying the way yeah. I should. But anyway, I got called into the office. Um, at Tennessee in, in Tech. That, in that third quarter. I, I had a note from the dean of students, Dean Sharp. He said, I want to see you in my office on Friday. That cannot be a good, a good thing, no. usually. How many students were there at that time, roughly? Uh, probably 3,000. So that was pretty significant. They wanted yeah. to see you. Yeah. So he called me in and he said, uh, Mr. Trotter, you like going to Tennessee Tech? I said, I do. He said, your grades don't show that. And I'm telling you now. If your grades don't improve, you will no longer be allowed to go to Tennessee Tech. How bad were they? Well, I don't know, D's and F's and, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd come out of high school. I wasn't uh, one of the honor students, but I'd, I'd made good grades in high school. You weren't school. stupid, were you? No. <laughs> well, no. Well, some might say I was, but anyway. Um, so I said, yes, sir, I'm going to change that. So I got to thinking. If I, if I don't like civil engineering, what is it about my high school courses that I like the most? And it was English. So I decided I would uh, change to English. And I stayed in there two quarters and I loved it. But I got to thinking, if I graduate the degree in English, what am I gonna do? I didn't really wanna teach. And I didn't, although I loved writing, I didn't feel like I wanted to write speeches for somebody else to give. And you compare the salary of a teacher with a civil engineer, there's a whole lot of difference. So I went to my uh, high school algebra teacher and told her about my dilemma. Why her? Because she was an, an important influence in my life. 
And again, I loved all of, I had most of those math courses I took was in her class. And I said, I, and she knew I had, a, I had my heart set on being a civil engineer. So I said, you know, it's just, it just hasn't worked out for me. I've got to decide what I would like to do. And she said, well, Beecher, and th these are exact words. She said, the space program in Huntsville is taking off. <laughs> and she said, they are looking for math majors. How would you like to be a, an employee of NASA? I said, boy, that would be pretty cool to do that. So I changed my major to math. And I was in that a couple of quarters. And I liked it. You know, I had all that math back. It was easy for me. I liked it. But I got to thinking, is it more important to be happy <clears throat> or is the money more important? And I decided it's better to be happy. And not knowing still what I do as an English major, I changed back to English. Because you See, liked it. Yeah, because I liked it. And so here's how, you know, I believe that there are no coincidences in life. God, God is guiding us. If, if God has a purpose for us, he does, and he does for everybody, he will, he will guide you toward that purpose, even when you may not know it. So when I changed to English, that was about the time that Lola and I got married. So, you know, not having to go out to the country to pick her up and come back for a day and back and forth that way. I had more time to study, so I focused on what I was doing. But I still, now having a bride, I needed more than two part-time jobs, believe it or not. One of my part-time jobs was as a desk clerk in the Shanks Hotel. Janks, Shanks Hotel was the place to stay in Cookville, Tennessee. I'd been there for years. In fact, the owner of the hotel was a man named Pip Shanks, who was a World War II aviator. His, grandfather, his father, and I think maybe his grandfather, had started that hotel, so it was a, a long time. What, what did you do there? So I, I got a job as a desk clerk, and I would work from six in the evening till midnight, or midnight till six, or sometimes six to six. And the beauty of that is, D, that most of the guests would go to bed about 10 o'clock. I had all that time to study. To study. Mm -hmm. I could sit there in the lobby in front of the fireplace and really make hay with studying. So a man named, and here's how God works things out. A man named Coleman Harwell, who was editor of the Nashville, Tennessean for 25 years, and by the way, he was a good friend of the Kennedys. Anytime they'd come to Nashville, they'd come to see Coleman Harwell. But he retired and moved to Cookville. And they were, there were two separately owned weekly newspapers there. Bought both newspapers and would continue to operate them for a while until he finally could make them into a daily. But anyway, he'd come down, when he and his wife were looking for a house in, in Cookville, he was staying at the hotel and stayed there for like maybe a month or more. So when the guests had gone to bed, he'd come down to the lobby and talk to me. You was trying to study. Yeah, but to know who he was and the connections he had and that long history of journalism, I was really drawn to him. And we'd talk for maybe an hour at a time, sometimes or longer, because I'd ask him about some of the things that happened in Nashville. I'd been reading the newspaper, ask about some things that had happened in Nashville and how he dealt with mm -hmm. them and what he thought about the newspaper business and about the Kennedys and all that kind of stuff. So when I decided about another job, I thought, maybe Mr. Harwell will give me a job in the newspaper. So I'll go see him about that. And I talked to him about it. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, Beecher. I'll make a deal with you. I've been wanting to do a series of stories on one-room schools in Putnam County. At that time, there were still eight one-room schools scattered around Putnam County. He said, I'd like for you to visit each of, the, each of those schools, interview the people around those schools, family members who had kids in the school then or had, had them there before, see what to think about the school. And of course, in those rural areas, the school and the church were the two gathering places mm -hmm. for people. So those people loved those schools. They didn't want to take them away from them. Mm -hmm. And he said, also measure, if you can, the academic performance of those kids from those one-room schools 
when they come to high school in Cookville, compare those to the kids that go to elementary schools, those eight, eight <laughs> grade schools, and see what the academic performance is like between those who go to one-room schools and those who, who come there from... That was putting your math into play, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did, and here's what I discovered. Generally speaking, not in every case, but generally speaking, the kids in those one-room schools did better academically when they got to high school than did the kids from the city schools. And here's what I decided about that. The two things. Number one, let's say you're a fourth grader in one of those one-room schools, and you're at your desk working on your assignment, mm -hmm. while the teacher is talking to maybe those, those who are in the sixth grade mm -hmm. or the eighth grade about their assignments and their studies. Either consciously or subconsciously, while you're working on yours, you're also absorbing mm -hmm. what the teacher is saying. So you get a, a kind of a multifaceted education. But the, the second thing is, even though the, these were one-room schools, the teacher had lots of time to talk individually with those students and to monitor their progress, give them what they needed to encourage them. And so that bond between the teacher and those students, even in one-room schools, because typically they didn't have more than maybe 18 or 20. So there was two school. reasons you felt like yeah. they did better. Yeah. As a rule. As a rule. Was there any ambiguous about that, or was it you could definitely see I, a pattern? I think that was definitely the case. But that was interesting. So when I gave him the series, uh, Mr. Harville liked it and said, okay, you've got an ongoing part-time job. But you knew nothing. You were becoming a reporter. Yeah. Uh, here's the beauty of starting, and I've told other people I've hired at the banner of this, the beauty of getting started in a, in a weekly newspaper is that you do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. You're a reporter, I mean, for the news, covering politics or whatever happens. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of the things I really always appreciate about Lola if you're a reporter for that newspaper, you have an accident up on Monterey Mountain and the police or ambulance is rushing up there, you get out of bed and get your camera, you go. Well, she'd get up and go with me. Mm -hmm. um, or you could be a sports writer. In fact, um, I was also the sports editor for the Cookville Herald and <laughs> Herald Citizen. And, and, uh, and you write obituaries. I didn't have to cover weddings and the social things because they had a society editor there to take care of that. But most of the rest of it, you also would lay out the pages in the paper. What, what, what year would this have been or what time frame? Well, I graduated in 1961, so from, from 19, late 1959 through 1961, I worked part-time. And then when I graduated, I, I went to work part-time there. And... Uh, so you learned a lot of things, even developing the film. And back then, the cameras that you had were those big old press cameras you'd like to see in the movies. You had to look you know? down from the top. Yeah. And if you wanted a, to do a flash, you had to carry with you a five-pound a pack that had Good thing a low battery there. in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember... I remember covering those Tennessee Tech homecoming parades where I'd walk the whole route and that five pound pack on my shoulder would wear me out. <laughs> so, but anyway, that was, that was great experience. And, uh, but after each newspaper was out, Mr. Harrell would call me in his office and we'd go over that newspaper. He'd tell me all the, all the things he thought I did right, which were not very many. After every newspaper? After every newspaper. And there was what, weekly or? Weekly. Well, there was two. There, there were two weeklies. One yeah. of them came out on Tuesday and one came out on Thursday. So you had two meetings a week with him? Oh, yeah. And then he'd tell me everything that I did wrong, which was in the majority. <laughs> and I used to hate those meetings. Because did he tell you what was done right or was he one of those? No, he'd tell me first, he'd tell me first what I did right. And then he'd tell me what, he, what I thought could have been better where he thought I'd missed the bar somewhere. <laughs> did you explain to him why you might have done it that yeah, way, he, or did but, you? Yeah, but no, I, I, I did. I, I, he, he allowed me to express my opinion about it. But looking back on that, D, that was the best journalism education I could have ever had. An editor of the National Tennessean for 25 years, highly respected nationally for his work, and here he's investing in me to do that. 
All because you were working at the motel. At the hotel, yeah. So I worked there full time, and then I had a call from. And it, again, I, I'm talking too much, but um, there was a lady in one of my journal, journalism classes named Krista Cantrell from Sparta. She was um, two years ahead of me. She had uh, gone to work for the Cleveland Banner as a news and wire editor. And at that time, newspapers all over the country, including the Banner, were changing from the hot metal type of printing to what they call photo typesetting, which was an offset printing, which meant you didn't, both at the Herald Citizen uh, and at the Banner at that time, if you wanted to get things ready for the press, there was what they called a linotype machine that was invented in 1884. And it was the workhorse of the industry all up until the early 1960s. And it had a different uh, keyboard than typewriters did. And because it's linotype, you, they would produce, a, a, an operator would produce a line of metal type with a line of the paragraph in it. And there's what they called a pig, which had a uh, lead in it that would be heated till it was till it was liquid. And when the operator indicated that that hot metal liquid would drop down on that line, and the line then would be cast. And so, if you had a story with, let's say, you had a story with a hundred lines in it. The people who worked in the composing room would have to compose that story, you know, line by line, or they'd get to where they could, you know, a paragraph at a time or whatever, and then you put it in a metal plate and put it on the press. Well, um, there was always risk in that because if something happened to that hot metal, it, it could cause some serious injuries, and, and there were a few times that it happened there at the, at the Herald and the Citizen. So when I came to the banner, or the banner then was going to that phototype setting too, getting, getting out of that process. And so Krista was there then. And so the guy who came from the company in to help the banner convert from the hot metal to the phototype setting, and Krista began to date. And she decided she's going to marry the guy. He was from Louisiana. So she turned in her notice, and Lee Walls, who was the editor then, and owner, <laughs> uh, said, well, sorry to hear that, Krista. Do you know anybody would be interested in that? She said, well, I had this journalism class with a guy that might be named Beecher Hunter. She said, he said, well, give me his, his contact information. Had so you she, ever been to Cleveland before? I had been to Cleveland <laughs> one time, well, two times. When I was in the National Guard, we used to go to Fort Stewart, Georgia uh, for two weeks. And so on one of those times, we were coming back to Cookville and it was getting late. And so we camped out here off of um, 64 in a big field out there. That the whole troop? Yeah, the whole, uh, the whole well, it was the, it was the, it was the 230th uh, Battalion, mostly from the Cookville to Allgood, Livingston, the Upper Cumberland area, and spent the night and then went on back to Cookville. The other time was, Lola and I went to Daytona Beach on our honeymoon. We came through here. That was the only two times I'd been to Cleveland. You didn't think it was significant at the time, obviously. No, although I'd known a lot about Cleveland because one of my uncle's Harvey neighbors was a preacher with the Church Got a Prophecy. And every year he'd come to the assembly over here. And he'd come back and talk about Cleveland and the things that happened with the church. Mm -hmm. And so I knew from him a little bit about Cleveland, but not much. Um, and so when Lola and I came to visit at the interview with uh, Lee Walls, we were both fascinated with the town and think, thought we'd like to live here, and they made us a good offer, so we, that's when we moved. Did you hate it. leaving Cookville, the newspaper there? I, I did, but I, I wanted to grow in my profession, and this was a chance to do that. And to be honest, both Lola and I came from very close families, and we were always weekends and holidays and everything, we were either one or the other homes of my parents or her parents. And although we loved them, we decided, you know, now that we're 
married, maybe it'd be good for us to be a little bit away, <laughs> mm -hmm. close enough that we can come back and visit often, which we yeah. did. But uh, we thought it'd be better for our lives if we'd be a little bit away from them. But what year was this? Moved here in September of 1962. That's a long time. Yeah. You've been here longer than I have. Cleveland is a whole lot different than it was then. <laughs> Where was the newspaper then? Down on 2nd Street. Where the, uh, the city's in there now, right? It was, so. Uh, yeah, it was where Ralph Carroll's printing was. It was right next to Ralph Carroll's printing place. And Did Carroll Printing is still in there, but... Oh, it was next door to that. Yeah. But I think you're right. I think the city has that building I now. think so. Yeah. And before that, I don't know when they moved in there on 2nd Street, before that they had that place where Cafe Roma is now. Mm -hmm. And I think it still does have the banner building up top, or did for a while anyway. What do you see as the future to newspapers? I it's, mean, it's this wide now. Yeah, uh, back then newspapers were the medium where you got most of your news. You know, t TV was coming into its own and radio stations, but the primary source of news then was the newspaper. And had been for how long? Oh, for years. Since the 1890s, maybe? Uh, probably. Yeah, probably so, maybe even further back than that. What, what actually started the idea of, hey, let's write this up and send it to everybody every day? <laughs> I mean, it was sort of a unique idea probably, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I guess it was. Um, I mean, that was thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. Somebody somewhere probably said, what do you mean write down and send to everybody what's happening? Well, I think even back, way back, and I don't know the years certainly, but way back in, in England, I guess, uh, pamphlet kind of news, of news tabloids, tabloid okay. kind of things, or hey, maybe not even that, based the one page deal started being distributed some, and it just kind of grew from that. When you left Cookville coming to here, that was from a two-day newspaper to a five, to a six well, days. It, it was, uh, yeah, it was six days, and then... Um, Did you get hired to run, you got hired to run the whole thing? The banner? Yeah. No, the no, end. no. They had a good staff there. Oh. Had a good staff. But I mean, did, did, what, what was your job there when you came? Uh, I was the uh, news editor and news and wire editor because then we got our news over a teletype machine. Hmm. And it's, it's, and that, of course, I'd decide what the reporters would bring in for the local news and how to display that on the page, but I also was responsible for or taking off the teletype machine, the state and national and international news and decide what, we couldn't put everything in the paper obviously, but decide what was the most important news uh, for our readers. That's a pretty powerful position in a way, isn't it? It is. And uh, the thing about teletype machines, they would, you could hear them clicking and clattering, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the little room we had set aside for them. So you'd know they were, they were constantly running with stories from here and there. But if there was a story of some little more interest to people, they'd have, they had a system of alarm bells. One bell, if you heard on the teletype machine, but maybe there's something you ought to take a look. If it's two bells, that was an even more important story to get your attention to go look at the teletype machine. Three bells was really something very important in terms of impact on people and people's interest in knowing. And uh, I remember the day that uh, John F. Kennedy was shot. That teletype machine was going crazy. I mean, we'd already gone to press. Now, what does that mean? You've already, it's already printed, right? We'd already started the, the print, the press to running. And that teletype machine was going off like crazy, and so I went running there to see what was going on, and I saw that, so I had them stop the press. What'd you say? Stop the press? Yeah, well, I said, run back there and tell the press woman, stop the press, that Kennedy's been shot. We've got to remake the page. How far would he have been in this? You, now, now you're talking about wasting paper, right? Because you've yeah, already run I mean, some. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but how far would it have to go before you just said, and eh, we'll we'll catch that that article tomorrow. I, I even if it'd been the whole, and we'd probably run maybe um, a quarter of our press run. D, if it had been the whole thing, 
I would run it over again. Remake the page and run it over again. It was too important. And again, because the newspaper then was the primary source, people were lined up on the sidewalk in front of the newspaper office waiting to get that paper. Would you have to call somebody and say, hey, I'm going to stop the press, I'm going to waste some paper No, I just, sent, I just sent one reporter back. I said, You were in charge. Yeah, I said, stop that thing. <laughs> and what we'd done. So that everybody remembers but, where they were at that day, and you was at the yeah, newspaper. Yeah. But uh, back to the, uh, the change in offset. When I got there, they were in that offset changing process. The first day on the job, uh, I walked in and walked into the press room back there because then, because of the hot metal type that they were changing from, had a huge press back there. Deep down, I mean, it was a tall, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 feet below the floor when the press was sitting down on that level. And of course, they had stopped using it because they were getting into the photo top setting process, which was just mostly camera work. So I walked back there, and, and somebody had put a fishing pole on the bar that kept somebody from falling into the pit, <laughs> hanging on that bar, and down in that murky, inky water <laughs> down below was a little bobble floating down there. I said, is this place crazy or what? <laughs> but it's Ira Wade, who was the form composing room foreman back then, and he was kind of a jokester anyway, so. He was fishing. Yeah, he was fishing. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta laugh in times like that. Why, sure. Crazy. So you remember that as much as you do the Kennedy thing? Well, no, the Kennedy thing was really important, but that was kind of a funny thing that I remember from that. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you did you ever make any like wish like a print print something like I'm sure there's with the tele with that machine there's mistakes you can't go back and edit because you've already got the printer started. So it had to be a pretty significant mistake to stop the stop the press for that, right? Yeah, and I don't think I ever stopped the press except for that Kennedy story. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you if you make a serious error, you just try to clarify or correct yeah. it the next edition. So now, what what, what when how did, when did you as as you're at the, the newspaper, you you took was Goldie Wattenberger there then? He was. He was the advertising uh, director then for the newspaper. Lee Walls was the editor. His father owned the newspaper and about 50 others around the country. Mm -hmm. And Sid Gould at the time was the publisher. Sid was a, I think a New Yorker. Anyway, he was definitely a Yankee <laughs> who had moved down here and was uh, running the newspaper there. And he was an interesting guy. I uh, I liked him, although his ways were a little different than ours. But I liked him always. He had a he had a big boat that he kept out at uh, the B and B Marina. And one one day, he wrote an editorial in the newspaper saying that uh, the city council ought to dredge Mouse Creek. If they dredge Mouse Creek, I could I could bring my boat up near the <laughs> newspaper office. <laughs> yeah, you could just drive right up. That's <laughs> right. Were you there when they moved to the new location? No, I left, like I said, I was there in 1962, and I left in 1966 because, I know I'm taking too much time for no, this, but taking... the Chattanooga Times and the Chattanooga Free Press had a joint operating arrangement, and they were in the same building to save money. Mm -hmm. Now, they were independent newspapers owned by different parties, but if they could you know, have one place where they could run the press and, you know, it'd be cost savings for them. But because they had such editorial ideas that were so dramatically different, the Free Press decided it wasn't going to stay in that building with that liberal time Free now, Press was. Now, why, why, would they, why would they have so, be so dramatically, because they could choose because what to put one, in. One was Republican, one was Democrat. And that's, all, that's basically all there is to it. Yeah, that's what it boiled down to. Mm -hmm. So the Free Press decided they'd move out into their own building, which was on 11th Street. The Times was on 10th Street. And 
So when that happened, when they split and didn't have that joint publishing arrangement again, the Times decided, uh, the Free Press decided, they didn't have a Sunday paper, the Times did, but the Free Press decided, because they'd moved out and separated, they needed a Sunday paper. So they started publishing a Sunday paper. The Times decided then, well, if you're going to do that, we're going to start a, an afternoon paper. Now, remember, they're published more. They're gonna, we're going to start an afternoon paper mm -hmm. so that our advertisers can get a, a joint uh, ad price by running in both newspapers, mm -hmm. get a break on the, on the price. And so the Times did. And so I'd had somebody who had worked at the banner who'd gone down there some time before, and he told the Times that uh, I might be interested. So the Times called me and said, we're going to start this new paper, and would you like to be part of that? And then we talked about it a little bit, and I thought, well, this maybe is another opportunity to grow in my profession. So I said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk to him about it. So I did and went down and joined them. That was 1966. And I have to say, it was a pretty good newspaper. Um, it was a little more informal, a little more personality-oriented than the Times was then. Uh, and we, we were happy whenever we could beat the Times or the Free Press in <laughs> some of the stories that we got. So I stayed there until 1970 because the Free Press filed an antitrust suit against the Times, claiming the Times was trying to put them out of business, which they were. <laughs> and so as part of that settlement, the Times decided to drop the Chattanooga Post. And the Times asked me to stay on. I was the political courthouse reporter for them at the time. Uh, they asked me to stay on. But they already had somebody in that position, and I don't know why they asked me to stay, but they did. Uh, but I didn't think that was a very nice arrangement, and the managing editor's position came open with the banner, and I came back and talked to Lee about coming back to the banner, and he gave me that opportunity. So I came back, and that was 1970, and then by 1973, he, uh, he appointed me editor and Goldie to be the publisher, and then he left shortly after that. Lee uh, went to Houston to kind of be the, at the sort of the corporate headquarters for all the Walls newspapers. They were big, weren't they? They were big, yeah. They sure were. Does that, who, who owns it now? Well, uh, they sold a lot of those newspapers, but Lee Jr., and honestly, I don't know. I need to find that out, I guess. I don't know how many papers they still have, but Lee Jr., well, the Kugel papers are now. They weren't then, mm -hmm. but the Kugel papers now are part of that. Mm -hmm. They bought them uh, when Coleman Harwell left, but uh, or sold them. So uh, they're burst, based in Birmingham now. Does does he ever come to Cleveland? He does. Yeah. It, would nobody know he was the owner. He, of the... he doesn't come often, but he does come. They say that. Wonder how they arrived at the Cleveland newspaper. I mean, did they start the Cleveland newspaper, or was it started no, by Cleveland, somebody else? Cleveland newspaper, the Cleveland Banner, by the way, is one of the oldest newspapers in the state. It started on May the 1st, 1854. 1854. 1854. And, of course, in those early days, it was a weekly newspaper and then eventually became a daily. But you asked me a while ago about six days a week when I came. It was Monday through Saturday then. And a lot of the uh, advertisers and readers wanted a Sunday paper. Because a Sunday paper lays around the house longer, people got more time to read it. For sure. News and the advertisers mm -hmm. advertise. So it was decided we probably ought to do that. So um, there was a group that was formed to travel to two or three other newspapers who'd also done similar to that, who changed to a Sunday paper. We decided to drop the Saturday paper and add the Sunday paper. So. Uh, went, as I said, two or three different newspapers to see what we should do in the transition and what to avoid in the transition, and then came back and made it happen. So in 1974, the first Sunday edition rolled off the presses of the Cleveland Banner. Did, and, they, and they did away with the Saturday? Did away with the Saturday. Was there some people that didn't want to do away with the Saturday? There were, but uh, it really wasn't economical 
for the banner to keep a Saturday paper if you're going to have Sunday. The Sunday paper, they they get it. They get it at my house. It's there by way before I get up. Mm -hmm. What what do they have? To, I, I, you're not. I'm, you may not know now, but what time do they pick it up at the at the banner? I don't know now. Things have changed a lot since I was there. The method of printing and you know, computers have really made things so much better and more efficient uh, than it was when I was there. So do you, do you remember, that was 34 years ago when I left. Are you glad you left? I am. Um, I enjoyed it. I felt, again, that uh, God had led me to the banner, and I felt fulfilled in what I was doing, and... It's kind of an interesting story, but again, you know, God orchestrates your life when you're not even aware of what He wants you to do. But Forrest moved to town in 1957, and again, I came in 1962. I got to know him pretty quick because we were involved in some civic club things like JC activities, and we were on the YMCA board together. So the first building opened in 1970, January the 4th, 1970. Uh, is called uh, Garden Terrace Rehabilitation Center then. And so working for the banner, of course, that was big news for them. So I was there for the, well, actually for the groundbreaking and the grand opening. And so between 1970 and 1976, he built six centers, five in Tennessee and one in Florida and knew he couldn't get around and manage all six of them himself. So that was the year, 1976, that Life Care was incorporated to be the management company for those six buildings and any others he might be able to acquire. So when the corporation was formed, names of those early buildings, including this one in Cleveland, were changed to line up with the corporate identity. So it's now Life Care Center of Cleveland. But he would, when he'd bring people to town to leadership positions in Life Care, he'd want to get publicity and come to the banner and I got to meet them. And from time to time, he'd say, Beecher, we need to work together. I said, that'd be good, but I said, I'm happy where I am. So he stayed after me about that. And <clears throat> in 1985, nine years later, <laughs> he came to me and said, <clears throat> I'm going to develop a marketing division for Life Care. I want a vice president in charge of marketing for the nursing centers. I want a vice president in charge of the retirement centers. And I want a vice president of communications to serve both. And I'd like for you to take that job. I said, Forrest, I appreciate it, but I'm happy with the banner. I'm doing what I think I need to do. Well, he wouldn't give up on that. And so over the course of a year, we continued to talk off and on about that. And so finally, I prayed a lot about that and I decided Maybe I should do this because I like the I like the mission of taking care of people in a loving and compassionate way. I like that. So I decided to do it. So on March the third, nineteen eighty six, I I took that position. And it's been a joy. I'm I'm telling you, I couldn't you asked me early on, I, I could not have imagined ever working for a nursing home company. I, that would not have been in my radar anywhere. But Dee, I've had such a fulfilling and wonderful career. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change this for anything else I could think of that I would like better than working with Life Care. I met some incredible people. I mean, absolutely incredible people who've influenced my life in so many ways. What do you think gave you the ability to run those and run the newspaper? Where did you learn that? Because nowhere in this <clears throat> talk have you talked about how you were educated to do that, but yet you've been able to do it. So where did you learn that? Here's what I discovered. First of all, you hire good people who have certain gifts or talents to do the position you need them to fill and then kind of get out of their way and let them do it. It's mostly about people understanding that 
you know, I look, I look back on my career at Life Care, and Life Care hasn't grown, or Life Care hasn't uh, progressed because of me. It's grown and progressed because of people who believe in the mission and who dedicate themselves to do it. Life Care is a Christian-based corporation. And not everybody certainly is Christian. We, don't, we, don't, we didn't hire people on whether they were Christian or not. You couldn't do that. But because we are a Christian-based company and people know that, we attract Christians who want to work in that kind of mission. But I, I, I've seen, you know, again, working in a nursing center, D, as you might imagine, is hard. That's hard work. And you take somebody like a certified nursing assistant who really doesn't make that much money. And in my opinion, certified nursing assistants and nurses and other people don't work in long-term care for the money. They work because they believe they've been called by God to do what they do. Um, and they feel they're fulfilling his mission for them. Most of them, it's not about the money. It's about if it's you about, don't have it's a about passion serving. to be a CNA or a nurse. You wouldn't be one more than you a week. Would, no, you would not. You would not. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> we created in 1991 a customer service program to recognize the exceptional job a lot of our associates were doing in customer service. It's called the Whatever It Takes program. It's not an employer of the month or anything like that. It's separate from that. But to win the award, a person has to satisfy two basic criteria. It has to be an incident or a series of incidents of customer service, and it has to be something that goes beyond your job description, what you're not normally asked to do. So in each building each month, a person is chosen to be the winner of that award, gets a $100 bill, which is presented in a general staff meeting so that everybody understands the customer service that was performed. So the idea is they'll go and do likewise, you know. But at the end of the year, out of the 12 monthly winners in each building, a, an annual winner is chosen. That person gets $500 and is su submitted for division competition. Life care is divided into eight operating divisions. A division has like from 24 to 40 nursing centers in it. So each division then will pick an annual one, and that person gets $1,000. So in one, in one, uh, in one year, work, one person could receive a minimum of $1,600, could win more than that if they won for more than one month in the building. That happens a few times. So we bring the division winners, those eight division winners, to Cleveland for the annual meeting and, and recognize them in front of all of our associates and count out the money and thank them for what they do. But let me give you an example of why that important, program is important. Again, I'm talking too much, but... No, you're not. You know where Rutledge, Tennessee is? Mm -hmm. We have a nursing facility there uh, called Ridgeview Terrace. Rutledge, Tennessee has a population of about 1,100 people. That nursing center has 125 beds in it, but it stays very successful, full most of the time. You might wonder, in a town like Rutledge, Tennessee, with that kind of population, how in the world could that happen? Well, let me tell you. There's a, there's a nursing assistant named Donna White Sykes who works there. She learned from one of the nurses that a female resident, she was dying, was dying of cancer, didn't have long to live. In fact, a woman brought it up to Donna and said, Donna, I know that I'm dying, but that's all right. I've lived a long life and I'm ready to go. But she said, if I had one wish, it'd be to see my brother again. She said, I haven't talked to him in years. I don't even know where he lives. Well, Donna thought it's tragic that the woman is dying, wants to see her brother and can't. But she remembers there's this television program called Unsolved Mysteries that does things like this. So on her own time, with her own money, mm -hmm. she calls the production staff in California, tells them the situation, that they want to find that brother. And they said, you know, we sound like a good story for us and we'd like to help, but um, we've got a backlog of other stories. It'll be maybe eight weeks before we can get back to you. Well, Donna didn't think the woman had that long to live, so she goes back to her and finds out her hometown is Hyman, Kentucky. So Donna places 
an ad in the newspaper in Hyman, Kentucky to run four consecutive weeks to say, again, on our own time and on money, I'm looking for information, um, information about so-and-so. If you can help, call me at this number. Well, she gets several telephone calls from cousins of the woman who tell her that in the beginning of that family, there were 14 brothers and sisters, seven of whom are still living. One by one, Donna calls each one of those brothers and sisters to tell them the situation. Well, the visits arranged out of Ohio and Indiana down to Rutledge, Tennessee, the visit of this woman. The brother that she'd specifically ask about lived in California. And when Donna talked to him on the phone, he talked to his sister a time or two and had planned to come and see her, but she died before he got there. Now, that's a pretty remarkable story of caring for your customer, if there's more to it. In the research, Donna discovered that the woman had a son who was taken away from her when he was six years old. Now, let me tell you why. This woman was born blind. She was a very bright girl, went to the Nashville School for the Blind, got a good education, met this young man and married him, and they had the little boy. Well, the eye condition that had caused her blindness from birth continued to deteriorate until doctors told her the eyeballs would have to be removed. In the course of the surgery, her brain was damaged. When the husband found out about that, he left her, took the little boy with him, gave the little boy to a sister of his to raise, and told the little boy that his mother was dead. Boy, what an idiot. When Donna learns that, she keeps searching until she finds the son living in Scottsdale, Arizona, where he's a real estate salesman. She calls him up and she said, my name is Donna White Sykes, and I just thought you'd want to know that your mother is in our facility and she's dying of cancer. Well, his reaction is, lady, I don't know what you're talking about. My mother's dead. My father told me so. She said, well, let me tell you about your uncles and aunts. So she goes down the list of the brothers and sisters she's talked to, and she tells him about a little bit about each one. And when she finishes, he says, this is certainly strange. That sounds like my family. I don't know what's going on here, but I'll come to Rutledge, Tennessee, and see for myself. So he comes to the building, walks into the room where the woman is, and even though he's not seen her since he was six years old, the moment he walks in, he knows that's his mother. Donna said they sat and talked for about six hours. The woman wouldn't turn loose of his hand the whole time. He told her about his growing up years, about his education, about his marriage, about his children, about his job. When it came time for him to go, he said to Donna, Donna, you'll never know what this means to me. To believe all these years that my mother was dead and now to find her again. So he goes back to Scottsdale. In the two weeks that she has left to live, he calls her every night and then brings his family back for the funeral. Hearing that story, She's naturally one of our whatever-it-takes winners, and so we go up to have the ceremony in front of her associates and other residents and give her the money. And after it's over, I said, Donna, why would you do all that? You've got a family of your own. You've got a very demanding job here. Why would you do that? And she said, I just thought, what if I'm dying and I haven't seen one of my daughters in a long time? What would I give to see her again? And she said, when I asked myself that question, I knew what I had to do. Donna White Sykes is a follower of Christ. That's part of what propelled, propelled her to do what she did. That was one of the first winners in her What It Takes program, and she's become the icon for that program. But there are others like... It'd be hard to match that one, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, but we have Bethany Satovia, who works in our building in Chesterfield, Missouri. One of her patients, she learned a man who couldn't read or write. So she spends all of her spare time at evenings and weekends to teach him how to read and to write. And then when his rehab time was up, it was time for him to go, he stood up in front of that staff and read a letter that he had written thanking them for what had happened to him. Now, D, what greater gift can you give anybody than the ability to read? What's the world like for people who don't know how to read or to write? And what a precious gift she gave to that man. So I'm just telling you, not everybody can work in long-term care. I understand that. But the people who do are dedicated 
to what they do. And they do an amazing job. And through all this pandemic, my regard for people working long-term care is magnified even more because people in those nursing centers go in to work knowing they run the risk of getting COVID-19. But beyond that, I'm sure that many of the families beg them not to go to work because they'll bring that home and give it to them. But they go anyway. It's their duty, and they go anyway. It's a remarkable set of people. That is incredible. Yeah. One of our, in one of our facilities up in Fork Union, Virginia, a nurse's aide named, named Yolanda Jones came into work one morning, 7 o'clock, and she saw this young cerebral palsy boy who was getting ready to go to school. It was going to be the first day of school. And he was dressed in an outfit that was tattered and soiled, and she didn't think he ought to go to school looking like that, so she rushed around the building and found something else for him to wear. When she finished her shift that afternoon, she went to her house, took out a new outfit she'd bought for one of her daughters, took it back to the department store and exchanged it for that young man. Now, Dee, she was only making then. This was back in 1992, I think. She was only making $6 an hour. And she couldn't really afford to do that, but she did it because she cared about that boy. Now, she is such a good nurse's aide, they, they offered her over and over again to give her scholarship money so she could, get, could become a, an LPN or an RN. She turned it down by saying, these residents depend on me. They depend on me. Thank you very much, but I'll just stay where I am. Now, I will tell you that some years later, she decided she would follow that, and she did become a nurse. But incredible people. So you're saying it's not the culture that y'all have set, or that Life Care set, or that you set. It's the people in this industry that have that desire. That, plus we have tried to promote and encourage with this one of the this program you were you were yeah, mentioning right right but now when you went into life care they had what six facilities uh, no i didn't when i went to life care in 1986 by that time they had 91 buildings mm -hmm. they have 208 today in 28 states plus uh 43 assisted living and independent living buildings that forrest put off into a separate company called sister park in fact Garden Plaza down here is part of that Century Park company. And you were watching over all of this? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Prayerfully. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, how do you think in these multiples? Because you've got great leadership. I don't believe that. You, There's you, something that listen, brought you listen. to this. If you've got eight divisions, each division has a division vice president who has the responsibility for that division. Divisions are broken down into regions. Most of the divisions have three different regions. A region has like eight to ten buildings in that. I understand that, but I'm not buying it. What, how did you do it? You were watching over all of this stuff. What in your background gave you this ability? You keep dodging that, but you, you've got this <laughs> ability. It's not an accident. Well, I believe Ooh. I believe that. Uh, I guess God, it was him. <laughs> yeah. I believe. Is that eight o'clock already? I believe that God gives each of us unique talents. You can do things I could never do. Maybe. Those people who, who work as certified nursing assistants or nurses, I could never do their job. I could never do that. One of my gifts is communication particularly writing, but also speaking. Where did you learn that? Well, trial and error, I guess. <laughs> Teresa Evans said you gave a speech at her somewhere. She said you were by far the best speaker she had ever heard. Well, I appreciate that. But Well, for one thing, I, I guess it started in church. Um, but... For example, when I got to Cookville Central High School, I, I'm a sports fan, 
And growing up as a kid in, on the west side of Cookville, we didn't have little leagues and for baseball or football or field, field events and track and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, sort of thing. But I was always a runner. Even, you know, one, one of my, you know, I guess when I was in elementary school, mostly, I just loved to run. I'd love to go out in the woods and just run, think and enjoy the scenery around me. And so when I got to Cookville Central, I thought, Cookville Central, by the way, that time was kind of, they kind of ruled the Upper Cumberland area in football. Eddie Watson was the football coach then. He was the grandfather of uh, the guy at, who was t coach at Texas for years, and then um, and then his other his other grandson was the coach at Vanderbilt for a while. But Cougar Central had really good football teams, so I thought I'd go out for football. So I went one day and talked to when I was a freshman, talked to Coach Watson about that. I probably weighed by that by that ten maybe 105 pounds, something like that. <laughs> I'd see those big linemen for, yeah. I said, I don't belong out here. <laughs> and Coach Watson said, well, maybe you ought to try the debate team. <laughs> you know, I thought about that. I said, well, that's a pretty good idea. I'd love to, again, I loved English. So by the time I was a sophomore, I joined Miss Pinkerton's debate team. And we go to tournaments. I mean, Nashville, Carthage, different places around to actually have a debate competition. So I did that, and, and, and if, you, if you took a subject that you were going to debate for, you have to, you have to be prepared, because you, you didn't know exactly what side you were going to be on, whether you were pro for that question or con for that question. You had to be able to debate both sides of it. Whether you agreed or whether not. Whether you agreed or not, you had to debate mm. both sides. And so I took that pretty seriously and uh, worked hard at it. Miss Pinkerton, by then, debate was, again, it was, Kugel was always good in that, and the debate leader coach uh, was Ms. Herman Pinkerton. She had a rule that she was, she, for her debate team, she would want two boys paired or two girls paired. She didn't want mixed. And so in the sophomore year when we were, she was setting up the teams, it turned out that there wasn't enough to have two of one or two of the other. And so me being the new kid in the area, and Carol Hudson, who was the other, we didn't have a team she could put us on. She said, I don't like to do this, but y'all can be the team. Mm -hmm. So Carol and I took that as a challenge. She didn't think we were good enough to be <laughs> on the debate team. And she had, a, she had a senior debate team, we were sophomores, she had a senior debate team that really everybody talked about. These guys are really, really good. So the first debate tournament we had was in Nashville. I forgot the name of the school, but they had representatives from different schools come there for the tournament. And you had, we had, uh, throughout that day, we had six different debates. And so, when the day was over and we were driving back to Cookville, Ms. Pinkerton came up and said, well, congratulations. You're the only one of the teams that had a five and one record. <laughs> so <laughs> it was because we were driven by the fact she didn't think we could do it. <laughs> I don't see you as a debater as much as I am. I see you as a, a pull, to pull the team together. The debating, the debate team cause you not to want to debate. Does that make sense? I, I, uh, I think writing is my greatest passion, more than speaking. When you say you, you, you enjoyed English, is that what you meant, like writing? Writing, and I enjoyed literature too. Like but, reading? Yeah, yeah. But the writing appealed to me most. It, it, when I was in the third grade, I didn't, I was too young to even think about gifts that God had given you or whatever. But I happened to win, in the third grade, I happened to win a poetry contest. And I thought it was an accident that I won, actually. Do you remember the poem? I do. I wish I still had it, but it was about winter and 
and part of the poem I talk about marsh uh, snow and marshmallow caps on fence posts and other things like that. I wish I still had it, but but anyway, what what struck me at the time was Tech had student teachers who would come down. They were learning how to teach, That's, hence student teachers. Mm -hmm. And we had one assigned our class that read those poems. And he came to mind and he looked at it and he said, this is exceptional. And he said to the teacher, is it okay with you and Beecher if I borrow this? He said, I'd like to take it back to my English class and show them what y'all have done. And it was fine with me. I was, I, actually, I was kind of complimented by that he'd think that. But uh, the teacher was Miss Amy Johnson. She said, okay, but just be sure and bring it back. Yeah, I will, I will. He never brought it back. And of course, back then, you didn't, you didn't have a way of copying things, you this know. This is so third grade. Third grade. How do you remember her first name? You said Amy Johnson. How do you remember her? I'll tell you. You you always given people's names by the first and last name. You I'll must tell have a you, really good memory. I'll tell you why she was so special to me. But um, now remember, this is Cookville on top of the upper uh, the Cumberland Plateau, where it's not snows a whole lot more than it does here. <laughs> by the way, yeah. So it was getting close to Christmas time in her class. We started talking about Christmas, and she had all of us kids drawing Christmas scenes and so on, and like you would do a Christmas card and posting them on the you know bulletin board and on the walls, and frost paint the, some of the windows with scenes. And she had three or four boys uh, go to the woods to cut down a cedar tree. Can't do that now, but we did it. <laughs> and bring it back, and the class decorated it. And as you do, I don't know if they still do it now or not, you draw names so that you didn't have give a present to every kid in the class who were friends of yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just have one name to find a present for, and that way everybody get a present. So we'd draw names, and then finally it came time for the last day before the Christmas break. And Miss Amy had not given any... Uh, homework assignment before. This is going to be the party. Leave early, go home. Distribute the gifts. So we had the party, and then she went to the tree, and she'd pull out those wrapped presents one at a time, and she'd call out the child's name that was on there. And So the packages were all handed out, and she dismissed everybody for the break. Well, as I walked the one mile home in the snow, there were tears coming down my cheeks because after all the presents had been passed out, there was not one for me. Now, can you think how a third grade kid would feel if everybody got a present and you didn't? So I went home, went into my room, and lay down on the bed sobbing. About 45 minutes later, the car pulled up. It was Miss Amy. And when she knocked on the door, and my mother came to the door, she said, uh, Miss Hunter, after all the children had left, I discovered this box over in the corner that had Beecher's name on it. Somehow we overlooked it. So my mother called me. I went in and started pulling off the wrapping paper. And it was one of those ring toss sets, you know, where you have a stake and you try to get pretty good at hitting the stake. It didn't matter what it was. Yeah. yeah. But I realized later she'd not found that box in the corner. She'd noticed one of her. Students had gone upset, home upset, and she went downtown to Cougal, bought that present, wrapped it. And that's how you remember her first name. So is there any wonder she became a mentor for me all through the third grade class? But not just there, beyond through elementary school and high school, and I visit with her often about things. And... Uh, Later, after I'd moved to Cleveland and was working at the Banner, um, if I was coming through Cleveland it's on the way to Nashville or Knoxville, I'd try to find time to stop at the hospital where my mother was a volunteer, spend a little time with her. Well, by that time, Miss Amy was also a volunteer in the hospital. So I was able to visit with my mother and then go down and see Miss Amy about three months before she died. And uh, 
we had a time to talk about that third grade Christmas party. In all the ways, she'd been such an influence for me. And I'm glad we got to have that conversation to thank her for what she'd done. That's why Amy Johnson is special to me. And that's why you remember her first name. Yeah. But um, let me say this. I, I just got through saying a while ago that all of us are given talents by God. He expects us to use them for him. Uh, maybe I shouldn't tell this. Uh, there are only a few people that have heard it because it's very personal. But as you know, the uh, Church of God of Prophecy and Holy's Annual Assemblies every year. And of course, that was big news for the banner because that brings in... You know, sometimes they'd have as many as 25,000 delegates who'd come here. And people would rent out their houses and stuff. To, yeah, to take, get money for vacation yeah. and get out of town yeah. while all this traffic yeah. going on. Yeah. So one afternoon, I don't remember what year it was, but one afternoon I was up in the... Were you ever in that? Never was. It was a magnificent auditorium. Seat 10,006 people. I, I take that back. I did go in before they demoed it. Yeah, it, an auditorium it in, in the round, you know. Yeah, uh, not no columns. It was all supported by mm -hmm. outer edges of yeah. it. Yeah. But uh, one afternoon, I was up in the upper part, uh, upper deck, in the public relations department, getting some information about the meeting, and what's going on, and what the agenda was, and all of a sudden, through the intercom that came in through the window, I heard singing down on the stage and it was some of the it was such a beautiful song and being sung was amazing so I walked over to the window so I could see who was doing it to listen to the rest of the song and it was a young black man and when he finished the song he walked just a short distance on the stage over the piano and he began to play that piano I'd never heard a piano played like that before and I turned to the secretary in the PR department and said things that I'd said before. Why is it that some people get all the talents and other, others of us get none? I'm telling you, Dean, have I ever heard God speak to me audibly? No, but I can tell you for certain there was a voice welled up inside of me and I know whose voice it was. And he said to me, Beecher, how can you be so unthankful? I've given you talents, and you don't even acknowledge it. And I said, Lord, forgive me. You have, and I will never say that again. God spoke to me. I have no doubt about that. And I've told people in life care, not that story exactly, but I've said, look, God has given you talent, and you need to use that talent. First of all, you need to recognize the talents he's given you. And if you don't know what the talents are he's given you, you need to think about that and decide what they are. Because you've been given, given those talents for a purpose. So I don't brag about that. I can't brag about it because I didn't earn those gifts. God gave those gifts to me. So I can't brag about it. But my responsibility is to use those talents in a way that honors him and his children. And that's what I've tried to do with it. So you ask me what I do, how I've been able to lead a company. God has given me those talents. And I've tried to encourage people, direct people, but help them grow in their career. And if you have happy, fulfilled people working for you, you can have a great company. So that's what I've tried to do. Part of what I've done is to do that on a, because of the gifts God has given me. I mentioned a while ago to, to, to you that I, I uh, would do a video weekly on the LCCA web page. But I've also done every day, every... Five days a week, I did a devotional, a perspective, I called it, that went on 
Life Care's intranet site, went to all the Life Care computers all across the country. And they were designed mostly, again, to inspire, to recognize, to encourage, and uh, it's, um, I think it's been something that has uh, unified and directed our company, reminding them what our true mission is and helping them feel proud of the work that they do. So you ask that question. That's how I think I've been able to lead. Do you think the story of the Bible with the man with the talents that God was talking about money or what you're talking about? I think it could be both. Money, I think, can be Which a measure. What do you think he was talking about, though? I think he was talking about the gifts he gives you, the talents he gives you. Not necessarily. Not the necessarily the money. But I That's think that's never dawned on me until just today, just now. Yeah. I've always thought it was money, but because but you you you've you've enlightened me. You, you can think the about the money part, but giving a tithe or beyond the tithe, and that is important. But God also expects you to tithe on your time also expects you to tithe on the talents he's given you, how you exercise those talents. So it is about the money, yes, but it's more than that. Do you think we have an obligation as individuals to help where we can? Absolutely. Yes. To raise our hand when somebody needs help to, yeah. to do. Yeah. Now a lot of people think, well, that's none of my business. But I think maybe people have lost the feeling of 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 feeling like they an obligation to help. Yeah. I think maybe the obligation yeah. is not as popular as it used to be. Yeah. Would you say that is different difference in people today? Yeah. I think I think our society generally speaking, I mean there certainly a lot of people go way beyond what they do and I've met a lot of them, but I think society as a whole has become more self aggrandized. Um, what's in it for me and mine? Um more inward concern than outward. Um, I do. Now, if you were going to write, you said you enjoyed writing. You would enjoy. Have you thought about writing any books? Yeah. I've decided several years ago, and I couldn't because of too much to do at Life Care, that I wanted to write a couple of books. Is uh, this the next phase? Yeah. I. Uh, I also did, not over the last three or four years, I guess, I started doing podcasts for Life Care. Um, I, I'd like to kind of pick that up again since I've left. Um, but I do want to I do want to write a book or two. One of the things I'd like to do is write a book about the life care, health care in general is so serious, and it should be serious. You're dealing with people's lives and emotions and families and mm -hmm. It's serious business, but at the same time, there are hilarious things that happen. So I'd like to write a, a story on the humor in left care. Would you stay in health, uh, in health care or life care, or would you branch out into other areas I might like fiction out. or I might branch documentaries out. or what would you? I might branch out in it. There's there's some great stories I could tell about the humor. Let me tell you about one. In Marysville, Washington, we have a nursing center there. And so Forrest and I were there touring one day. And so the executive director takes, oh, you need to meet Agnes Benal, famous opera singer. So we go around to her room. She's lying in bed, but still very mentally alert. So we get into conversation. We probably talked, you know, 25 or 30 minutes. She was telling us about 
how grateful she was that God had given her this voice to sing, and she tried to use it to praise God, but she also was in some very famous operas in some of the opera houses around the world, and how much she'd enjoyed her career. So then she looks at me, I'm standing at the foot of the bed, she looks at me and says, okay, Mr. Hunter, what is your favorite opera? You know, I studied Shakespeare in, in English in college, Midsummer Night's Dream, Julius Caesar, Stepford Wise, all, all those things. I was totally blank. So she, here she's this opera singer <laughs> waiting for me to answer. And you knew the answer, right? No, I couldn't. Oh. I was just blank. But, I mean, you did, but you just couldn't think. So after a few seconds of her waiting, it seemed like minutes, I finally said, well, I guess grand old opera. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> She turned her face to the wall in obvious disgust yeah. <laughs> that somebody would say that at this prestigious career yeah, right, she had. Right. And then she turned back over and said, well, I guess I could expect that from anybody from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> but there are things like that that yeah. happen, you know, yeah. they're just outrageously funny. And you mentioned Claude Ogle a lot. That is absolutely the funniest guy I think I ever met. Did you see any of those videos? No, I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I need, just remember Claude. I need to get some of those for you. This is a guy who could say, a, at 100 years old, he could say ABC's backwards. I can't hardly say them forward. I can't either. But <laughs> have to sing it. <laughs> he, he, was, he had such wit and humor that at 100 years old, we just start, in 2015, we just start, decided to start every day of our annual management, four days in a row, with what we called... Uh, um, a day, uh, the title was The Humor of Mr. Life Care, I think. Mm -hmm. So we, we'd take about two minutes of that, and he was just outrageously funny. I mean, outrageously funny. <laughs> He's the finest individual I ever saw for loving life the way he did. And from 100 on, he lived to be 104, but he'd get up every morning in his wheelchair. He'd go room to room to those residents saying, hope you have a great day today. <laughs> he was just a cheerleader for the facility. <laughs> That'd drive me crazy, but I guess some people would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you think there's a correlation between people that love life and live longer? I do. I do believe that. I mean, can you... I, believe, you can, I, believe, I believe people who are positive, who, who find the humor in life, who can laugh a lot, look for the joy in life, I think it does add to your years. Maybe that, that could be a sequel to your one bedroom, to your one room schoolhouses, and whether or not they do better Yeah, at it, the it colleges. Be. I believe there's research on that that shows that. But I mean, now you could go from people that are happier how they how they do if they live longer yeah yeah so <laughs> i remember too I appreciate let, me give you, let me give you one more i'll give give me one hey cut that we'll cut that out, that one out um the first year that i let's see no it's it, probably the second year i was with life care i guess but life care had this big multimedia uh, display in one of the buildings. We had a screen 34 feet long. We had 16 projectors that were going at once for this show. One of the scenes in there was a picture of uh, uh, it was a picture of Reagan. Um, we were talking about something about being involved in your community or something. So it was a picture of Reagan uh, being elected president. And so Forrest and I happened to be in Denver when Bush, the first Bush, was elected president. So I thought, we've got to change that slide in the projector. So while we're in Denver, this big headline on you know, Bush winning uh, the presidency. So I bought one of those Denver posts, carefully carried it back to Cleveland and protected it against rain or whatever else. <laughs> So I hired a photographer, that's before we had one, I hired a photographer, went up to Life Care Center Cleveland. I found this woman who had this classic hair and beautiful face and asked if, uh, you know, we could get her holding it and get a picture of it. 
Sure, she said. So we did. Got a great picture, I thought. So while we were there, I thought I'd take the photographer, you know, since I'm paying for him, <laughs> take yeah. him around the rest of the room and the yeah. uh, rest of the yeah. nursing home <laughs> to get some more pictures. So came back. I got to looking for the paper. I'd left it on a desk over there. And then I noticed, not the same one, but I noticed a woman patient over by the wall sitting in the chair, and she had that, pic that paper on her lap. So I went over to the woman, and I said, uh, ma'am, um, uh, I brought that paper all the way from Denver, and I need to take it with me. She didn't say a word, but said, mm -mm. So I said, please, ma'am, I said, I've, this paper is very important to me. We may need to take another picture of it. She, so I thought, I need to work psychologically with her. So I found a Chattanooga Times paper, and I took it over, and I said, Ma'am, this is the Chattanooga paper, and it has a, probably has a lot of stories and information about people you know and places here, and it'd be more important to you than this Denver paper. Let me swap this with you. <laughs> she looked at that Chattanooga paper. I wouldn't wipe my butt. <laughs> the nurses around just roared in laughter. So I said, Ma'am, you just keep that Denver paper. <laughs> you never know what people are going to say. You never you? know. <laughs> do you do you remember the mall before, or the village, the Cleveland Mall before? Were you involved in the takeover there? Uh, yeah, uh, we. You know that uh, Forrest bought that. Most of the tenants, you know, moved out when Bagley Square Mall opened up. Yeah. And so Forrest had really, give you a little history here, Forrest had felt that we needed a second campus of offices. So he had bought 16 acres of land out here north on Stewart Road, where the YMCA and First Baptist are now. Mm -hmm. That was going to be the site for the next uh, campus. Yeah. About three months after he bought it, somebody said to him, you know, the Cleveland Mall property might be available at a good price. So he investigated. There's 280,000 square feet of space in that building on 28 acres of land. He bought it for a million and a half dollars. And it so, was perfect, wasn't it? So the insurance company owned it, really wanted to get rid of it. Now, what we spent on it since then is another matter. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, it, it's, it's been such a great campus for us too. It looks good. Yeah. I mean, from the road, it looks like Have you been inside it, any? I went there one time, and they wouldn't let me get 10 foot past the door. Really? I mean, it's, it's pretty pretty well secure. Mm -hmm. I guess you can get in there. Well, I couldn't now, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> that so? Well, again, I've taken way too much time. What time is it? It's after 6 o'clock. Sorry about that. Major, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. It's been awesome. Well, nice to spend time with you all. So.